Hello, I'm Hannah, and this is Hannah's Books. If you've been watching my channel during Victober, you know that I'm actually reading fiction successfully this month. Wildly, given my traditional reading practices, during the COVID pandemic, I've been struggling to read fiction. Until this month, I've been struggling to pay attention to novels in general. Instead, I've been drawn into mainstream history, biographies, memoirs, etc., this year more than usual. Nevertheless, I still have a zillion nonfiction books I'm eager to read, especially some books released this year. I almost never read contemporary fiction hot off the presses, but I do really enjoy participating in conversations about new works of nonfiction. They are much more accessible through my library, unlike new works of fiction, which often have extremely long hold lists. I've managed to amass quite a pile from my library, from the bookstore, and a couple from publishers. Nonfiction November couldn't come at a better time. This year will be the sixth celebration of Nonfiction November on Booktube, and it will be my second celebration since I started my channel. This year's hosts are the incomparable Olive at the channel A Book Olive, Sabrina at Stecacino over on Twitter, Natalie at the channel Curious Reader, Jill at The Book Bully, and Andrea at Infinite Text. All their participants only need to read some nonfiction during the month. The hosts have given us a way to up our games. They put together a list of four prompts. As has been true for Nonfiction November in the past, the four prompts are just four individual words. One of the best parts of watching people's TBRs for this readathon is seeing the creativity that people use when they come up with clever ways to link the books they want to read during the month to the four prompts that team members have thought up. Today, I want to go through my own list, a list which is far longer than I will actually be able to read, but from which I think I will be making my choices as the month goes along. I suspect there will be some chaos here in the U.S. during November, at least the early part, and that my emotions will be running on overdrive during that period, so I'm a little reluctant to actually commit to a particular set of books for the month. So really, these are just some ideas for now. Also, I'll be answering all the prompts in this video, but not in the order in which the host presented them, for reasons that I think will be clear from my first answer. So let's go through the list. The first prompt I'll talk about is buzz. The presidential election and also the elections for the House and Senate are a huge part of the buzz going on in the news here in the U.S. And I gather a huge buzz across the world as well. The importance of this particular election is so intense that many of us are so stressed out that it's hard to sleep, hard to be nice to people we love, even if we totally agree with them about politics, and hard to be effective activists doubled by the restraints that the pandemic places on traditional get-out-the-vote processes. I've decided that since my whole brain and body are buzzing with nervous energy about what's happening here, I'll spend the first few days of the month of November reading books about voting. I have four books in mind, all published in 2020, about the issue of suffrage in this country. The buzz about suffrage is not only because of the upcoming election. 2020 is the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, the amendment that gave women the right to vote in the United States, with some major limitations, which the books I am going to mention all address. First, I'm on the whole list at my local public library for a brand new book, Martha S. Jones' Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All. And I'm hoping it will come into the library in time for curbside pickup next weekend. Jones is an exceptional scholar. But this book is aimed far beyond just an academic audience. This book is designed to map out the territory from the earliest days of the United States 
up through the 1965 Voting Rights Act, discussing the political lives of African American women. The author talks about the ways these activists defied both racism and sexism to fight for the ballot for themselves, and also how they worked to make this a country ensuring the equality and dignity of all Americans. Obviously, this is a very timely book, at this time in history where black women have been at the fore of progressive politics, not just to push for the inclusion of people of color and the inclusion of women in the world of politics, but to push for a more just country, inclusive of all Americans. A related book, perhaps a little more academic, that I'd love to look through is Recasting the Vote, How Women of Color Transformed the Suffrage Movement, authored by Kathleen D. Cahill. Like Martha Jones, Cahill makes it clear that the issue of women's suffrage wasn't settled nearly as easily as the traditional story so many of us think we know, the story starting with a meeting of white ladies at Seneca Falls and ending with the 19th Amendment. The author looks at not only black participants in the movement, but at an even larger multiracial group of activists pushing for a more inclusive vision of equal rights. She considers work done in social clubs in New York's Chinatown, at conferences for American Indian rights, in newspapers and pamphlets demanding equality for Spanish-speaking New Mexicans. Many of the feminists of color she introduces are, as the book says, a new cast of heroines who have been largely ignored in earlier histories of the topic. And of course, like Martha Jones, she points out that the project to make a more perfect union is still very much unfinished, and many of its leaders are women of color. The next book, published a few days after my part of the world shut down because of the pandemic, is Freethinker, Sex, Suffrage, and the Extraordinary Life of Helen Hamilton Gardner, written by Kimberly Hamlin. Helen Hamlin Gardner devoted much of her life to championing women's rights and critiquing the sexual double standard. Unlike many American feminists of the time, she was opposed to supposedly feminine piety, temperance, and conventional thinking. Many scholars argue that she was one of the main activists who made it possible for the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote, to pass. Eventually, she became the highest-ranking woman in federal government. She was also a woman who led an unconventional life, who had a long affair with a married man. Gardner did not hide it, but instead fought for both gender and sexual equity. In fact, she was sometimes called a Harriet Beecher Stowe of fallen women. At the same time that Gardner might be seen as a forward thinker on issues of gender and sexuality, she was not progressive on issues of race. The author doesn't shy away from discussing Gardner's racism and acknowledging how the 19th Amendment really did not apply to all women until the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Hamlin explores how other white feminists and suffrage leaders were shaped by systemic racism as well. It sounds like the book might be an interesting pairing with Martha Jones' book, Vanguard. Okay, I want to mention one more new book in this buzz category, one that I know some of you might appreciate if you're looking for a broader book about the suffrage movement as a whole. And that book is Suffrage, Women's Long Battle for the Vote, written by Ellen Carroll Du Bois. Her book, published early in 2020, starts with pre-Civil War feminism and its links to the abolitionist movement, then explores how constitutional amendments after the Civil War gave black men and other men of color the right to vote, but did not extend suffrage to women, white or non-white. She then talks about how Jim Crow racism and violence in the late 19th and early 20th centuries erased black men's rights, supposedly guaranteed under law, and then how the 19th Amendment passed and then was expanded by the Voting Rights Act. Unlike older studies of the suffrage movement, Du Bois is more inclusive of non-white feminists in all the time periods she discusses, from widely known figures such as Sojourner Truth and Ida B. Wells Barnett to the everyday activists on the line. If you are fairly new to the whole history of women's suffrage in the United States, this book is a great place to start. 
Okay, the next prompt is movement. I'm really interested in reading more about some of the poets and thinkers who wrote during the Romantic era, a movement of writers and artists and thinkers during the early years of the 19th century who celebrated emotions and individualism and the natural world, all at a time when industrialization and the slightly earlier enlightenment was leading culture in the opposite direction. I'm going to mention three books here, two of which I have commitments to read with other people. First is Radical Wordsworth, The Poet Who Changed the World by Jonathan Bate, a scholar whose work on Shakespeare I have long admired and published in 2020. This book, as the title suggests, is about William Wordsworth, who, along with Samuel Taylor Coleridge, is often credited with launching the Romantic era in English literature. Jennifer Brooks and I have been chatting about reading this together. How exciting. Jennifer knows far more about the Romantic period than I do, and I can't wait to learn from her and with her. The next book for this prompt is a group read of Romantic Outlaws, The Extraordinary Lives of Mary Wollstonecraft and Mary Shelley, written by Charlotte Gordon. The booktube group will be led by Christy Lewis at the channel Dostoevsky in Space and Kate Howe. This sounds fascinating. It's a dual biography, a form I'll allude to later, of an early English feminist who wrote in the latter part of the 18th century, and her daughter, the early 19th century author of Frankenstein. The two did not know each other. Sadly, Wollstonecraft died just a couple of weeks after Shelley was born. This book talks about how Wollstonecraft's ideology, as well as her experiences, shaped the thinking of her daughter, how their lives paralleled each other, how their struggles mirrored each other, despite the movement of time. I'm thrilled to read some newish work on Mary Wollstonecraft, who was a fairly important part of my senior thesis work in college. I haven't thought about her for a couple of decades now. I'll have to go dig out my copy of her book, Vindication of the Rights of Women. Although I can't imagine I'll have time to get to it this coming month, I'm also really excited to read L.E.L., the Lost Life and Mysterious Death of the Female Byron by Lucasta Miller, a biography of the celebrated poet Letitia Elizabeth Landon, who used the pen name L.E.L. Landon's work was beloved by slightly more recent authors, including the Brontes and Edgar Allan Poe, as well as Virginia Woolf. But for almost a century, she's been all but forgotten. Certainly not a household name in the way that Wordsworth and Shelley and other romantics still kind of are. Miller apparently suggests that her scandalous private life led to the collapse of her reputation. It sounds like a fascinating study, and I hope I can get to it in 2021 if I don't read it this November. On to the third prompt word for nonfiction November, discovery. My three favorite discoveries of this year were my deep love for George Eliot, the deep resonance for me of the fiction of Virginia Woolf, and my absolute fascination with group biographies and the related genre of memoir biographies. I really love books that play different people's lives off against each other, by necessity illuminating larger themes of the time or times in which they live, rather than just their personal stories. I've already mentioned that I'll be reading Romantic Outlaws, but I have a couple of other group biographies in my TBR Possibilities stack. First is The World Broken Two, Virginia Woolf, T.S. Eliot, D.H. Lawrence, E.M. Forster, and The Year That Changed Literature by Bill Goldstein. The year under discussion is 1922, a time when the literary world was reeling from the experimental works of both Joyce and Proust. The book explores the personal traumas the authors were going through as their own literary careers developed in and contributed to the evolution of modernist literature in England. The second book in my stack in this category is another 2020 publication, the book Square Haunting, Five Writers in London Between the Wars by Francesca Wade. 
The square Wade refers to is Mecklenburg Square, a London neighborhood on the outskirts of Bloomsbury, the area which spawned a group of artists who supposedly lived in squares, painted in circles, and loved in triangles. Wade discovers that during the period between the two world wars, five different women lived at this one address. Modernist poet H.D., detective novelist Dorothy L. Sayers, classicist Jane Harrison, economic historian Eileen Power, and of course the author and publisher Virginia Woolf. They did not all live there together at the same time, but Wade traces their stories at a time when gender restrictions were changing and women's freedoms were fast expanding. All five of these women found both connections with others as well as individual freedoms and independence at this one address. I had the pleasure of reading a few sections prior to publication, and the passages were both beautifully written and engagingly argued. I can't believe I have not read the entire book yet, and it's high on my priorities list for nonfiction November. And finally in this category is a group biography fairly related to the subject of square haunting, but not about Virginia Woolf. That book is The Mutual Admiration Society, How Dorothy L. Sayers and Her Oxford Circle Remade the World for Women by Mo Moulton. Sayers is the famous one in this book, I gather, but rather than looking at her life in isolation, Moulton explores her lasting friendship with a group of other women who were some of the first women to attend Oxford University. The author points out that despite the increasing freedoms women gained during this period, sexism and misogyny limited their personal lives and their career opportunities. It was through their connections with each other that they mounted a resistance. Earlier this year, I read and absolutely loved Maggie Doherty's The Equivalents, and the Mutual Admiration Society sounds like it might have some things in common with that book. Wonderful. Okay, on to the fourth and final prompt word, time. It's about time I get some of these books read, since several of these books are ones I was given by publishers with the assumption that I would be writing formal reviews or at least filming a significant discussion about those books. All are about Southern literature. That is, literature written in the U.S. South, and these books are all studies of white 20th century authors. All of the studies are at least to some degree about race and how it matters in the various authors' works. William Faulkner, Eudora Welty, and Flannery O'Connor are all products of their time, a time in Southern history where racism was seen as a casual truth by many white residents, even when it was expressed in horrifically violent ways. All three of these authors thought about how history, how the past resonated in their own days in ways that made time seem like a revolutionary part of their writing. And by revolutionary here, I actually mean something that circles or revolves through their work. Since I am prioritizing these books this month, I won't talk about them in great detail here in this TBR video. You'll be hearing more about them later. One book in this group is a book I have already finished reading but not yet reviewed, here or elsewhere, and that is Michael Gora's The Saddest Words, William Faulkner's Civil War. Gora's book is especially interested in what time means to William Faulkner, an author who famously said, the past is never dead, it isn't even past. In addition to Gora's work, I plan to read the new two-volume biography of Faulkner by Carl Rawlison. Both volumes came out this year. And then I had two collections of essays about race and class in the fiction of Eudora Welty, one published by the University of Mississippi Press and an earlier one published by the University of Georgia Press, both edited by Harriet Pollock. I poked around in them a bit, but I need to read them more thoroughly and write something up. A nice pairing with them is the relatively new book about race in the work of Flannery O'Connor, Radical Ambivalence, by Angela Alemo O'Donnell, a book that inspired the response essay that made the rounds in booktube and the literary world more broadly earlier this year about O'Connor's racism.
I suspect I won't have any time to read extra books in this coming month, but I would love to throw in Margaret Eby's South Towards Home, Travels in Southern Literature. The author travels through the South, visiting the haunts of many 20th century Southern authors, black and white, and considers how they use the people and places they lived among to populate the world of their fiction. This book, too, talks about how time, the continuing resonance of the past into the present and even the future, matters so deeply in all fiction, but is perhaps especially prominent in Southern fiction. And Margaret Eby's book sounds like it fits into that special subgenre I've been loving so much earlier this year of an author combining literary criticism, biography, and memoir in one book. Perhaps it will be a December read if I can't get to it this month. Well, this is a long video with a very long list of possibilities for my TBR, so many of which I am very excited about reading but a few of which I really need to read because I've made commitments to other people, buddy readers and publishers and review sites. Wish me luck. I'm so eager to hear what y'all are planning to read for nonfiction November. I put a whole bunch of your TBR videos in my watch later file to get to when I have a few moments, and I'm really looking forward to catching up. If you don't have a video up, either because you don't have a channel or because you haven't gotten it completed yet, I'd especially like to hear your plans down below in the comments. So here is to a wonderful nonfiction November. Thanks for joining me today here on Hannah's Books. See you soon.